There may be no other biblical account as ridiculed as the Genesis account of the global flood. College professors are especially happy to state unequivocally that the flood account is a make-believe event. But when we study the features of our own planet, what do the details reveal? In this episode of Origins, our guest takes you on a journey exploring the physical evidence that proves there truly was a global flood. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Flooded with Facts, Part 1, with Dr. Brad Harab. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Brad Harab, holds a degree in biology and a doctorate degree in anatomy and neurobiology from the College of Medicine at the University of Tennessee. Currently, he serves as the executive director of Focus Press and co-editor of Think Magazine. Dr. Harab travels the world speaking on Christian evidences, fortifying the family, and cultural apologetics. Welcome to the program, Brad. It's great to be with you, Ray. What are we going to be talking about today? So today we're going to be talking about what I consider to be one of the most probably challenged accounts in all of God's Word, and that is Noah and the global flood. We're going to be looking at evidence for the fact that there really was a global flood. Um, when you stop and think about how professors, a lot of folks in academia treat this account, it, it's not a pretty picture. Um, you think about a freshman going into a biology classroom and the professor holding up, maybe first they hold up a textbook and they say, hey, this is the, the book that you're going to be learning from. You're going to be tested over it. it. It costs $173. You can get it at the bookstore. And then oftentimes they'll hold up a Bible. And they'll maybe pause just long enough to, to see if there's any kind of a reaction. And they continue by saying something like this. Any of you that hold that there are truths in this book, or, or if you hold a biblical worldview, you need to either drop this class be prepared to fail. And with flourish, they throw it into a garbage can. Think about what that's doing ultimately to the hearts and the minds of, of young people who, you know, maybe grew up in a church, attending somewhere, and now suddenly they find their faith being challenged on the front line. You know, it's so hypocritical too because these same professors will talk about the importance of diversity and respecting other viewpoints and, and we both know they wouldn't dare to do that with a Koran or some other, oh, you know, religious yeah. book, but the Bible is, you know, fair game. Yeah, absolutely. And realistically, this is probably the account that, that skeptics love to pick on the most. You go on the internet and you find all kinds of websites where basically they're saying, hey, this, this thing's not real, it doesn't float. And sadly, too many of our young people are buying into that. Because if you stop and think about it for just a minute, Ray, kids grow up with what I call a fantasy version of this account. Um, you look at, you think about toddler books, the, the little boats that we buy, the two giraffes sticking their head out of the window of an arm. Over and over again, the picture that they're trying to sell, while it may seem good to parents, ultimately that's a false picture. And one of the things that we want to make sure we get across in this is, hey, it's a real account. It really did happen. There's evidence for it. Um, I, I know you've been to the Ark Encounter. Absolutely. And you, I'm sure you probably saw this particular display there where they're showing all these different books that have really the wrong message for young people today. You know, Brad, as a minister, I have families come up to me and they want to buy Bibles for their children. And I always tell them, when you look at a children's Bible, turn to the account of Noah's Ark. If it's something like 
Noah was a man who built a boat. Noah wanted to take a boat ride. Look at the animals get right, on. Right. If it doesn't mention the sin and the wickedness That's and right. the judgment of God, don't even look at the Bible anymore. Don't buy it. That's right. I, I tell people, think about it this way. It's, it is the most deadly event that has ever hit this earth. And yet, how many times do you see us putting pictures of the ark in our church nurseries, you know, you, the deadly, most deadliest event of all time. And yet we're putting a picture of it in there with our babies. That's kind of, I told my wife, I said, it makes me want to travel with a Sharpie marker and draw dead bodies all over the place <laughs> just to give people a real impression of what it's like. Yeah, there was no other judgment and there won't be another judgment on this earth like that until Christ returns. Absolutely. It's amazing. Absolutely. A add to all of this what Hollywood has been doing where, for instance, you've got several years ago, there was a, a movie called Evan Almighty. that was just absolutely a, a mockery of this particular account. Uh, more recently, there was the movie Noah. I don't know if you saw I that saw one. I saw that one. I yeah. thought that was like, uh, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone meets Noah's Ark yeah, or something. I, I tell people, <laughs> I'm not sure if they even actually read the Genesis account. They got yeah. water right and they got a boat. Well, those uh, Transformer-like creatures, you know, just knocking people over with their clubs. It was, it was really entertaining, but it was not biblically accurate. Very much, very much <laughs> Hollywood. But if you stop and think about it, I, I do believe what we're seeing today is a lot of people who they grow up, they learn these accounts in the Bible and then they run off to school and somebody challenges your faith and eventually they have to decide, okay, am I going to give up the Bible or am I going to give up what I'm hearing from this professor? And far too often what they end up compromising is the opening chapters of God's Word. They give up the Bible. Like for instance, John Loftus is a, a guy who was brought up in a, a Christian environment. My understanding is he even preached for a little while before he abruptly left the church, ended up writing a book called Why I Rejected Christianity. I, I want you to pay attention to what the real reason was. He said, what happened to me theologically? The watershed for me and I suspect for others who have changed their assumptions is the factual and the historical reliability of Genesis chapters 1 through 11. He says, that's it. You know, as a minister, again, I, one of my uh, jobs in the presbytery is to train young ministers and examine them. I can't tell you how many young ministers will take a view that, well, either the flood is sort of an allegory or yes, it was yeah. a local flood. You know? yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I have a lot of difficulty accepting someone who can't, who can't process that chapter that it's clearly a literal flood being talked about. Absolutely, that changed the world. In fact, I'm going to go up to the board and, and I want us to look at some of that evidence together. You know, if I were a lawyer and I was going to prove to you that there really was a global flood, probably the very first place that I would start is on all the mountaintops all over the world. You, you know, if you go to the highest peaks in the world, Guess what you're going to find up here? Snow. You're going to find snow for <laughs> sure. You're, you're also going to find aquatic fossils, seashells. In fact, this is an image from a mountain range near Nepal. It's over 20,000 feet in elevation. I mean, that's, you're getting up close to where airplanes cruise. I've sent this picture to several atheists, and I've asked them, hey, how do you explain this? Guess what their normal response is? What? Local flood. Which I'm thinking, that's a really, really big local flood. So I always have fun with them. I will send them other images from other mountain ranges on different continents, places like the Appalachian Mountains, all containing aquatic fossils. And again, simply ask them, okay, then how do you explain these? And again, usually the response is, local flood. And I'm thinking, boy, that's a, a big local flood to cover three or four different continents all over the world and the highest mountain ranges. A uh, soldier brought these back from Iraq for me, one of the highest regions over there. And Ray, if you notice, some of these shells actually still have both valves together, which is a good indication this had to happen rapidly. This was not a, a slow 
event, this was a rapid covering of these particular fossils. In order to preserve it that way, because if it was slow, right, some of it would have decayed, they would have broken apart. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In fact, the highest mountain point in the world, Mount Everest, when climbers get up to the top of that particular peak and they put their victory flags down, they're actually putting those flags over the remains of animals, as you can see, that once were in the sea. And so we, we know the earth itself is speaking volumes about, yeah, there was a global flood. Now, while we're over in this area, hopefully I don't have to tell you, Mount Everest is not a, a coastal city, right? <laughs> I mean, the closest water source, major water source, about 450 miles away, which begs the question, how did those aquatic fossils get there unless there was this global event? Uh, interestingly, Ray, while we're over here, so we're in the China region, when the very first missionaries got to China, they already knew about creation. They knew about the flood. They said they didn't come from Chinese descent, but rather they said, we came from Japheth, one of Noah's sons. In fact, let me, let me kind of prove that for you. You probably know. Chinese people, they don't use letters the way we do. They use symbols. So the Chinese word for boat is actually made up of, of three very distinct symbols. Vessel, eight people, which makes up their word for boat. Wow, and there were eight people on the ark. Exactly, exactly. In fact, let me show you their word for garden. It's actually composed of four different characters. Dust, breath, two persons, in an enclosure, which again, pointing right back to the Genesis account of creation, Adam and Eve in a garden. And so we look at things like this and we realize, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of evidence. The other thing we ask is, okay, is there evidence from the earth itself? You know, we know the mountaintops are screaming out that yes, there was a flood. What about the striatal layers? If I were to ask you to go out Ray, and, and bend rock the way that we see in nature. Rocks don't bend real easy. No, rocks break. And yet, all over the world, what we see are striatal layers that are actually curved just like these. I, I took this picture a couple of years ago in Dearborn, Montana. Again, over and over again, what we see are sediment layers that in some cases aren't just curved, they're actually folded on themselves, which is telling us two things. It's telling us these layers were put down rapidly, but it's also pointing directly back to the flood. Uh, another area that I would take you, if I were a lawyer wanting to, to put this on trial, is to the Colorado-Utah border, where you've got the Dinosaur National Graveyard, um, you go there today and one of the most fascinating places in the world to see dinosaur fossils. You see quite literally hundreds and hundreds of them slammed into limestone rock. Now, fossilization by itself is just an absolutely amazing event. But when you start thinking about lifting a 40, 50, 60 ton animal and putting it into that limestone rock jumbled together with hundreds upon hundreds of dinosaurs, you realize there had to be some kind of a massive catastrophe. And so we see the evidence. The question is, what is a good explanation for the evidence? If you were to go there today and visit the, the ranger station, they actually have a picture of water sweeping all of these dinosaurs away. And then right below this particular picture, there is a, a placard, and I want you to look with me what their placard admits to. They say, after a seasonal, what's the next word? Flood. Flood. Seasonal flood. Seasonal flood. And they recognize without massive amounts of water, you're not going to get this kind of a, a fossilization process. I, I read a, an account where 
Some guys were asked about all these seashells, aquatic fossils on the tops of mountains, and they said, well, maybe rivers carried them there. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'll admit to you, I'm not a, uh, I don't have a degree in water or hydrology, but I do know water doesn't flow uphill. <laughs> Up to the tops of the mountains. You know, it, it seeks the lowest point. And so if you've got seashells and aquatic fossils on the top, it tells me there had to be water starting up there from something. Yeah, a river is not going to do that. So, well, Brad, uh, this is great stuff. We have to stop for a minute. We, we need to take a break. We'll be right back right after this. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. Brad Harab, who's been sharing about flooded with facts. We've been looking at Noah's Ark in the global flood. Brad, do we have evidence for this flood beyond what we've already talked about? And we've noticed a lot of things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we talked about the fact that it was literally all over the world. The mountaintops are screaming out evidence. The the layers, the different striatal layers are screaming out evidence for a global flood. Fossils are screaming out evidence. You know, for most people, if the Bible says it, that's enough. And I, I want to say that, yeah, absolutely. Genesis chapter 6 and following detail very specifically what happened in this major account. And I do want to point out before we move any further, think with me about what is the real message of this account? Too often our kids, as I mentioned earlier, they, they get caught up in two giraffes sticking their head out of the window of a boat. And yet the real message of this thing is, is sin, the wrath of God, his deliverance of Noah and his family. Yeah, I, Ray, I don't know if you've ever seen an animal or, or maybe even a human being that's drowned, but normally they will take water into their lungs. They'll go underwater for, you know, few minutes, five, seven, ten minutes, and then oftentimes that lifeless body will float right back up to the surface, and it will float lifelessly on the surface of the water for days, for weeks, and even in the right condition, even months, as the body starts to slowly decompose. Now, you know, picture in your mind for just a moment, being Noah, you walk out on the top deck of that boat, and you look out, and as far as your eye can see, you see every animal and every human floating lifelessly on the top of the water. That's a totally different picture than what a lot of times our kids come away with. It's a sobering thought. You know, we've all seen local floods or tidal waves or those tsunamis. And, yep. and you just see all of the, not, you know, just all the debris and the flotsam and jetsam just yeah. clumped up here and there and, and going, you know, it, it would have been a disaster. And, and you imagine that on a global scale from an angry God, which brings us directly into our, our next point, And that is lots and lots of civilizations have flood accounts. You know, if this really is something that happened, you would expect in our historical accounts that, yeah, there's going to be ancient civilizations that talk about a flood, and that's exactly what we discover. Since it affected everybody, if it was just in the Bible, 
it would be a little bit harder for us to say, well, why isn't, why doesn't anyone else remember or write about this? But exactly. if in fact, if it's the opposite and we have, you know, five, 10 dozens, maybe a few more, right? Right, we, absolutely. Quite a so few. so we, we jump into what I call the record of the rocks. Uh, I've had the opportunity to go on a couple of archeological digs and it's, it is absolutely amazing when you make a discovery and you start thinking back about the people, the culture that that artifact really represents. And so you ask the question, okay, do we have any ancient documents, any artifacts out there that, that really prove, yeah, there was a global flood or, or any kind of archeological discoveries that talk about an ancient flood? And the answer is quite literally, again, all across the planet. You know, we'll start with the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, a Babylonian discovery, about 800 B.C. This one is still, to my knowledge, still in the British Museum uh, over in London. And again, part of this particular account is dealing with this massive flood. But it's not just one single artifact. There are quite literally dozens and dozens of archaeological finds, things that point back where ancient civilizations have said, you know, in our history, there was this family that basically saved mankind. Uh, I did a spreadsheet one time showing all the different components of the Noahic flood, whether it be a you know, global flood, two, or a family, I was about to say two people, but eight people on the boat, um, two animals, two of each type of animal, getting on the boat, all these different specifics. And then down the left-hand side, I put all the different cultures or, or countries that have a flood account. And you'd be amazed. You, you look back at people like the Sumerians, the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Greeks, all the, the different myths that come out of there, the Mayans, all have flood accounts in their past all these different continents having all these different flood accounts. I mean, is it possible that they just copied each other or they copied the Bible? Oh, I, I, when you stop and think about it, major news events, 9-11 for just a moment. I, I, I have four children, all of which were born after 9-11, but they all know about 9-11 through me. And we've passed that on. They've seen some pictures. They know that history and they will pass that on to their children, just like this particular thing. And yet the flood makes 9-11 kind of look like child's play when you're talking about how many people were actually killed in the flood. And because of Noah's flood, all of these different peoples are alive today. I mean, if, if Noah and his family don't get on the ark and don't uh, survive the flood, we're not, you know, there are no more people. Yeah, we, we're not here today. Every, virtually every Indo-European culture traces their heritage back to this guy named Japheth, who, as we both know, is one of Noah's sons. Um, one of the interesting things that I, I learned through my research was, for whatever reason, I, I don't know why, but American ladies seem to be very fascinated with the royal family over in Britain. I discovered that one of the ways that the royal family kind of ties themselves into history is they have a book in uh, Buckingham Palace. Now, I'll go ahead and admit to you, they have not allowed me to see it yet. I'm still working <laughs> on that. But that book traces their lineage all the way back to this guy named Japheth. That's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And it, it brings biblical history into our culture and into real life and you realize, wait a second, this isn't just some story that we tell our three and four year olds that has a, a cute little account, but rather this is a real life account that changed forever this world. You know, you think if, if the people and, and these experts and these scholars, very intelligent people, academics, you know, if they would just take this evidence and just admit what it is, I mean, can you imagine how different uh, of a culture that we would have oh, if we were all reminded of constantly that God uh, is angry with sin and that he has punished it once. And in fact, the, you know, the scriptures refer to Noah's flood as a type of what's going to come again. 
Absolutely. And, and, and instead of admitting that, instead of realizing, hey, you know, this is, this is problematic, they're going the other way. Um, basically where they don't want to identify any kind of sin. They don't want to make an admission that, hey, this is problematic. In, instead, our culture today is embracing sin. And like you say, if they would simply examine the evidence and admit, hey, this is all pointing right back to the Bible. You know, it makes me wonder if we're not becoming more and more like the generation of Noah's day because as you know, Brad, the Bible refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. And we know from the results of the flood that his congregation wasn't very big. It was his family. Absolutely. And no one else believed. No one else believed his message. No one else got on the ark. They didn't want to hear about the judgment that he was preaching. And, and I, it seems to me that we still don't want to hear about the judgment that, that actually did come. And, and people are denying it and, and, and therefore they're, they're not going to be prepared when Christ comes again. That's right. Absolutely. Well, Brad, I want to uh, thank you for being with us. Absolutely. It's great, right? I hope that you'll join us again sometime. I would love to do that. And I want to thank you for being with us as well. You know, many scholars, scientists, and professors look for opportunities to criticize the Bible. And one of their favorite targets is the global flood of Noah's Ark. They will say it's impossible, but the actual evidence in the earth itself shows something very different from marine fossils on the highest mountains, to curved rock layers, to massive fossil graveyards, to the records of ancient peoples, the earth itself declares the truth of the Bible. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof really is all around you. You know, if you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support prayerfully and financially makes a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time right here on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2407, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.